Shalom. I'm Doug, and I'm here today with Dr. Dustin Burlett, and we want to encourage you in the study of the biblical languages. Dr. Dustin Burlett, thanks for coming on the program today. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, would you like to tell our guests a little bit about yourself? Sure. So my name is Dustin Burlett. I live in Manitoba in a city called Winnipeg, and we joke up here in Canada that it's actually called Manasnoba Winnipeg <laughs> because, you know, uh, we get, you know, fairly cold weather up here. I work at Miller College of the Bible. It's one college with three campuses, all located in Western Canada, one in British Columbia, one in Saskatchewan, and I work here in the one in Manitoba. So I'm a biblical scholar, and I teach the biblical languages. I have taught uh, Greek at an advanced level. I taught our Greek Romans class. But right now, my bread and butter is actually Hebrew, and I thoroughly enjoy and appreciate it. Excellent. So you are certainly uh, one who has enjoyed the biblical languages uh, for some time. And I think I think we connected. Uh, maybe uh, you were finished your uh, Ph.D. degree, as I recall, and we had connected over some Hebrew stuff and uh, also some things with the Creation Theology Society. That's right. And, you know, it was your article actually on coal that I really uh, found that I appreciated your attention to detail and your linguistic sensitivities. Fantastic article. Then, of course, your work on the flood is uh, absolutely superb. I love your methodology. Uh, linguistics is an advanced area that I believe every biblical scholar needs to be able to lean into more. Well, I appreciate uh, your work as well uh, and the flood account, having that in common with our, our doctoral studies. But, of course, you, you took a, a different kind of method that we'll, we'll try to talk about a little bit later, right? Rhetorical criticism. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, well, before we get into to that, uh, which is going to be a great uh, great thing for our listeners and viewers to, to check out, uh, could you just tell us a bit about what sparked your interest in the biblical languages and, and just kind of the path that put you on? Certainly. So, my Bible college, I graduated with my bachelor's from Peace River Bible Institute, which is in northern Alberta, and they offered Greek at a very advanced level. You could take uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, four full semesters of Greek. And there was actually, I wouldn't call it a secret society, but there was actually a society associated with people who made it through all the different levels of Greek. And you got a Greek name given to you and a certificate and, you know, the secret handshake, you know, all the different <laughs> stuff, right? But for me personally, it was in my master's degree. So I graduated from Providence Theological Seminary, which is in Otterburn. It's in southern Manitoba. And I was in a Master of Divinity of Biblical Languages. And Dr. Gus Conkle has had the most profound impact on my life. Gus can read both the Greek New Testament and the Hebrew Bible of the Old Testament by sight in the original. I have known nobody in all of the history of my experience with biblical languages, anybody who has been able to do that. And so when I first started encountering Gus's facility with the languages, and then Gus began to impart to me a belief that I myself personally might also gain, maybe not that level of fluency, but at least a higher degree. Oh man, I was on fire because he gave me the encouragement and the support and the training that I needed to do it. So it was actually in my MDiv that things really began to take off for me. Excellent. So it sounds like you had a pretty, pretty robust experience there and, and a great mentor. That's, that's wonderful. Yes. And then even in my PhD program, uh, Dr. Mark Boda was also fantastic because what Mark did was he solidified for me uh, the necessity of grammar. I don't want to overstate things, but if you can't find it in the grammars, it doesn't exist. And so he really helped me to sharpen the concept and the idea that the method is the magic. And so what counts as evidence and why? So whenever we're studying or analyzing uh, the Hebrew text or the Greek New Testament or some of the Aramaic portions of Scripture, I always am making consistent references back to the grammars to try to better ascertain how is this functioning and to what end. Well, you mentioned your doctoral program, uh, your dissertation on the flood account we've, we've mentioned there. Uh, could you tell us kind of how uh, your use of the methodology with rhetorical criticism kind of interfaced with the study of biblical languages and, and 
you know, with grammatical understandings, because there, there seems to be like a couple of different worlds here when you think about it through this lens of uh, rhetorical criticism, which you can define for us, and then, and then also the, the more traditional grammatical understandings. Absolutely, and I appreciate that you brought up the grammatical, you know, the grammatical historical interpretation of Scripture. I often like to have students imagine a triangle, because, uh, you know, without geometry, life is pointless, right? So if you have a triangle, it just makes things a lot more clear. But, you know, the foundation of Scripture is that historical component, and we can't ignore it. And that's often where context comes into play. But the Bible isn't just history. It's events that have transpired in space of time through literature. And that's where genre analysis and all those things come to play. But the Bible is more than just history. It's more than just literature. And so the historical grammatical component, I believe, is somewhat deficient in terms of there needs to be the cherry on top. And so the apex of the triangle is theology. And that's where rhetorical criticism really comes into play, is it recognizes the persuasive nature of Scripture. All Scripture is God-breathed, and it's profitable to make a person wise unto salvation, and it does it through various means. What rhetorical criticism does is it acknowledges the persuasive component and how Scripture is in fact meant to be worldview formative rhetoric. It's meant to change how we think and how we behave. It's meant to affect not just our head, but our hearts and our hands. And that's what rhetorical criticism does, is it gives Scripture its due as Scripture. It's more than history. It's more than literature. It's theology. It sounds to me, when you use this term, rhetorical criticism, that for some people, when they hear the word criticism, they think, oh, negative, like destroying, tearing apart. But that's not, that's not what I'm hearing the way you're describing this term. No, it's kind of like the word argument often makes people conjure up ideas of a slamming door. But there is, in fact, good arguments. And what rhetorical criticism more or less is trying to do is help to understand that Scripture is actually trying to craft an argument. It won't leave you without making a decision. It's vying for your attention, and it's vying for your energies. And it wants you to lean into it and lean towards it. So the idea here with this this kind of criticism, uh, it's not like uh, higher criticism. It's not something that denies the authority of uh, and the inspiration of Scripture, which you you already indicated that you are affirming. That's correct. And so uh, I do discuss such as uh, J E D P. But what I use within my own text is the final form, what most people would call the canonical form. And right. so though there is acknowledgement that a lot of people could see source criticism within the flood in particular, I work with the final form. So when we're talking about this, uh, this criticism, then maybe a helpful way for some people to conceptualize it if, you know, if that term ends up being difficult for some people is we're, we're talking more about critical thinking. We're talking about uh, processing and paying attention to certain details and and just trying to understand what the literature is doing and what and what you're doing here you are trying to understand what it is doing on its own terms through a certain type of methodology right that's correct and you know i remain fairly unapologetic about it um one of my former instructors was actually trent perlonman the third and he wrote this book uh called the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom and he talks in there about how all exegetes need to be hermeneutically savvy. And hermeneutics is a pretty big word. But when we go to the doctor, we always trust them to use the most sophisticated and specialized technology available to them, and including its nomenclature. And so why should it be any different for biblical scholars? When a biblical exegete approaches the text, we expect them to use the latest resources. And yes, we have to be aware of those who are manufacturing antiques. Truth is old. But our lens of interpreting the truth can, does, and perhaps, I believe, should change as context and culture demand. So we've got new tools available to us, new resources available to us. And what rhetorical criticism does is it helps prevent bias. Because we're all conditioned by our upbringing, our culture, and all these different things. But what rhetorical criticism does is it helps allow the text to speak as it should versus bringing our own lens of interpretations to the text. So it helps counter bias. Excellent. 
Well, I like that uh, that analogy with uh, the medical field, and I think about uh, things like like archaeology as well, and and just some of the amazing finds that we've had, even a few years ago with the unrolling of that charred Leviticus scroll through the digital technology, and nothing was different about that Leviticus scroll. We just found a new way to, to access that. Some of these different methods, like rhetorical criticism, modern linguistics, and so forth, at their best, they are they are simply trying to get back to the ancient authors and the ancient texts and help us understand them better, not invent new things. And that's right. And you know, I appreciate how you approach this, Doug, because your particular methodology, you know, when we talk about systemic functional linguistics or even generative grammar with respect to Chomsky and stuff, Barry Banstra actually read my dissertation prior to publication. And one of the things that he was trying to help weigh in and assess, and of course he wrote the Baylor Handbook on Genesis 1 through 11, was he was like, are you sure that rhetorical criticism is an effective method for adjudicating the uh, different, you know, what we would call basically pericopes, or the different segments of scripture? And I really appreciated his feedback and comments in that area, but, you know, you can't reinvent the wheel. And unfortunately, when it comes to uh, most of these methodologists, you can't be a machinist and just weld the two pieces together. Systemic functional linguistics has its own path. Rhetorical criticism has its own path. And so the deficiencies of the one have to be complemented by the other. And so I actually told a few people explicitly, you know, I know a guy, and I mentioned your name. He's writing an excellent dissertation on the flood, and whatever deficiencies my book has, his will basically more or less shore them up. So I wasn't worried. <laughs> well, one of the things I acknowledged in my research too was, uh, you know, that, that other things could and needed to, to be brought in. Of course, you'd already done the, the rhetorical criticism, but I think in both of our cases, we realized the methodology we were using. It's not a one-stop shop. It's just no. uh, an additional uh, aspect of, you know, another toolkit uh, to just help us in a more holistic approach to the text. And one thing I really appreciated about your your study, a, lo a lot of dissertations will focus on a small passage or a verse, a half a verse, a word in biblical studies, but your approach was to take the flood account in its entirety, and yes, you're segmenting it into smaller units, but there is this continual uh, zooming in and out between the parts and the whole with what you're doing. So would you like to speak to that and how rhetorical criticism applied to the flood account helped you to understand the, both the parts and the whole? some examples. Absolutely, and I believe theologically that the doctrine of God also speaks to this because we have the immanence of God and then of course, you know, the omnipotence of God. And whether we look through a telescope or a microscope, we can see his grandeur, we can see his wonder, we can see his beauty, but we can also see his wisdom. Now, my particular dissertation rarely focused on, let's say, the Masoretic accents. There were certain times where certain things perhaps could have been elaborated more on but you always want to see the forest through the trees. And so when you get caught up in the minutia of the grammar, one of the key things for me was the, was the key conjunction. So Genesis 8.21 uh, speaks about how even though humanity is sinful all the time, I will never again send the flood. But when you go back to Genesis 6, it says explicitly, using the same conjunction key, because humanity is evil and wicked, I'm going to send the flood. Well, that particular key conjunction, I spent hours and hours trying to deliberate about his different grammatical functions and, and is there a contradiction going on between Genesis 6 and Genesis 8 and how does the grammar come to play and is this a concessive, is this an emphatic? How does all that, you know? But that's also theology because when we begin to understand how the two intersect, we don't see any actual contradiction. We simply see an enveloping of the full orb of God's approach to his creation. And that's, uh, that's just a prime specimen of where we have to be very careful. We're very thankful for having the scriptures translated into the vernacular. But if we just lean on an English translation for that, we, we would completely miss uh, that kind of connection, right? That's right. And you know, it's interesting because recently I was at McGill University in Montreal. And I was part of Congress as the Federation for Humanities. And so I was presenting for the Canadian American Theological Association. I serve on their executive committee. And I was also doing a presentation for uh, the Canadian Society for Biblical Studies.
But I was talking about exegetical fallacies, and I was talking about how all too often certain scholars will fail to differentiate between the different stems of the Hebrew language. And so certain scholars will actually make the case that when Adam, when Adam was placed in the garden, it's interesting because in certain contexts it uses one particular word, and in other contexts it uses another word, and that other word is the hippo form of Noah, you know, and so certain people were trying to say that Adam was designed to fulfill the Shabbat Shalom of the seventh day rest. And then, of course, the segue, biblical, theologically speaking, from God to Adam in the garden to Noah and how the uh, ark Noah on the mountains of Ararat. But what was interesting is that there's a Hiphil 1 and a Hiphil 2. Yes. And actually, the Hiphil 1 is to set or to place, and the Hiphil 2 is to cause to rest. Or it actually might be the other way around. I actually can't remember now. But my paper was centered on how we need to have a very clear and a very methodologically robust system for such theological statements and that they are grounded in grammar. And so I believe that the grammar needs to dictate the theology. And yes, I believe that we have to have an awareness of our presuppositions. But that's where the grammar, the where the grammar goes, that's where the theology must lead. And it is constrained by the grammar and the context. And even in Genesis 3.1, I mean, in Genesis 3.1a, we have how the serpent was more subtle than any of the other beasts. And then that exact same word and phrase and uh, combination appears in Genesis 3.1b, where the serpent is uh, using his words to deceive Eve and then saying, you must not eat from any of the trees. It's the same from all statement, but the grammar and the function actually operates differently even within the same verse because of how uh, more or less the different operating systems work for grammar. Right, and uh, this is just a, a reminder because I, I know that people at times they'll take a course or two in the languages or maybe not even get there and think they can, can use you know, strong concordance or electronic tools or something like that as a substitute. But there is certainly a level of complexity that when we start making certain claims, as you said about the theology, uh, the interpretation of the text, uh, sometimes we can be wrestling with things that we, we don't have a clue what we've got hold of. So this is helpful. That's right. Um, at McMaster Divinity College, that's where I earned my terminal degree, there's a particular author who came out of that school named Benjamin Baxter. And he wrote a series of articles on word studies, and then he, he wrote a follow-up book for pastors and for preachers to help them avoid exegetical fallacies. But I worked with individuals who were so, so, so intellectually beyond me, and they found exegetical fallacies within D.A. Carson's exegetical fallacies and actually wrote articles on them. Right. Well, there you go. And of course, none of us, you know, we're finite. We're all going to make some mistakes at times. But to have the training that we could uh, humbly sit back and say, oh, yeah, <laughs> mea culpa. I, I wondered, though, and yeah. I feel it's okay to share this here with you, Doug. I have often wondered about whether or not the root fallacy perhaps actually is a fallacy in and of itself. But that's where the Masoretic pointing is so important because according to the ancients, we have a system of interpretation that actually helps us to alleviate things such as the root fallacies. And so I'm trying to do a lot more work recently on this idea of exegetical fallacies, trying to determine things about where the root fallacy could or could not come into play, more or less using the accentual pointing. That's my newest research. Okay. Can, can you define uh, how you understand the root fallacy for us? Well, I believe that often how it can be construed is there's an etymological fallacy where because, for instance, in Hebrew, you have usually the same three consonants. But just because a particular word might still have the same three root consonants does not mean that they're even the same, the same word. And even if they're the same three consonants, if they're in a different stem, there's still nuances. So Naham, for instance... In Job, a lot rests on what did it mean that Job nahonged? Was he comforted? Was he consoled? Or did he repent? And that's right. where Bill Barrett can actually, Dr. August Conkel, uh, actually uh, don't agree with one another. And you can actually see some of that within the English Standard Version, both the translation and some of the study notes, because they actually both worked on it. And I myself personally thoroughly appreciate Dr. Bill Barrick. I think he's a wonderful scholar, and I use his work all the time. But of course, I also studied under 
uh, Gus Conkel. And so when it comes to Job, I think that this is a perfect example of Naham and how the entire theology of the book can hinge on one word and what that one word might mean within that particular stem and within that particular context. And would you say when you're dealing with um, a common root or or common consonants of that root that you're going to have a rhetorical function? I'm thinking like in English how we might take something like S-O-L-E, which can mean uh, only, or it could be the sole of your shoe or of your foot. And we could make a funny joke about, you know, maybe there was one footprint, uh, you know, that uh, muddied up the kitchen or something, not two. And there's the sole soul. And we don't mean <laughs> that no. those two words are the same, even the same word, even though they're identical, but there would be something of a, a rhetorical uh, device going on there that would catch one's attention to it to make that impression. So do you think there's things like that in Hebrew as well? I do think that there's some possibility there. You know, my family and I were recently watching Diary of a Wimpy Kid, and you might be able to determine the age of my kids because of that movie. But it's interesting because they were playing tennis, and at one point in time they were given the score, and they said the word love, right? And the other individual, uh, you know, um, it's, it's his best friend and him who were playing Neither of them had ever played tennis, and they didn't understand it. And they thought that the other people were flirting with them by using that terminology, love. But the way that most exegetical fallacies work today is, you know, you look it up in a lexicon, and then all of a sudden, you know, if you're the preacher, and you're saying something, and it's like, did you know? And then they would hush their voice, and they would say, and, there could, and then they would try to make this association that has absolutely no correlation whatsoever to it. So... I think that we need to be very aware. I wrote an article on uh, how words are complex animals mm. and the need for us to become better attuned to why we should appreciate the original languages. And then I followed up with that article on how to use our translations as judiciously and, and effectively as possible. Because you never want to elevate the languages. They're not mystical. They're not magical. Uh, Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, you name it. They're just like any other language, and they have the exact same rules. And you never want to make somebody who doesn't know the languages as if somehow they are less than Christian. We can right. all take God at his word. And so there always needs to be the give and take. So I wrote these two articles to try to help complement each other. Why we need to read the Bible in the original languages, and why we can trust our translations, but also why we need to use multiple translations, etc. Right. Back to your digging into the original languages with the, uh, the flood account and bringing in the, the rhetorical uh, criticism, what would you say are, are just some, some major insights that you gained into the flood account uh, using that approach? Well, you know, it was interesting. I was a guest lecturer in a hermeneutics class at Canadian Mennonite University, and talking about languages, my wife is actually a Mennonite, and so there's a little play on words that we use in Mennonites, they eat what they can, and they can what they can't. And of course, the theological extrapolation from that is, is that labels are for jars, not people. But I was teaching at the Canadian Mennonite University, and it was on methods of interpretation, because it's a hermeneutics class, and they wanted me to use rhetorical criticism. And I was trying to find a way to engage the students in a kinesthetic way, so I photocopied the flood, and I gave, everybody had a pink highlighter and a green highlighter. And all your job was, was to every verse, if it was relating to salvation, it got a green. If it was relating to judgment, it got a pink because I couldn't find a red, right? So it was referring to the doom and gloom. And then every time there was uh, an all or an every or a whole, that universalistic totalic language, draw an arrow from, uh, to its reference point and then put positive or negative. And statistically speaking, it surprised me that nobody had ever done that for the flood account before. But verse by verse, there was statistically and proportionately more verses devoted to salvation than judgment. And the reference for the universalistic totalic language, particularly in Genesis 9 with the covenant, all point to statistically it's more significantly apportioned to salvation over judgment. Now, of course, the question is, is that good enough evidence? And in a recent interview that I did with the uh, Hebrew Bible Insights crew, they asked me a lot of very good questions about that, and I was able to discuss it a little yes. bit more. But I did find that incredibly intriguing, that just the concordance work and some simple observation exercises, which is always the first step of hermeneutics, 
observation, 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 that nobody had ever tabulated those results. Just those results in and of themselves, I found quite intriguing and stimulating, and I didn't even know that I would find them. Excellent. Yeah, I bet those uh, those were pretty marked up uh, papers they had after that was over. <laughs> yeah, and with the highlighter, yeah. sometimes it yeah. bleeds through, so it's yeah. only on the same page. Yeah. Right. Well, that's great. Well, your um, your book version of your dissertation, you titled Judgment and Salvation, a Rhetorical Critical Reading of Noah's Flood in Genesis. And, uh, and, and you know, it just makes me think, you know, not only your, your highlighting exercise, but the fact that the flood account ends as it does <laughs> with the covenant and the covenant sign and, and the fact that uh, there are still humans on the earth. <laughs> it just kind of supports, <laughs> you know, what you're That's going for as well. So, yeah. And I also believe yeah. that it's actually, it's not insignificant that there's no ancient years and precedent for a covenant. You read, all, like, my Akkadian is very poor. So I took Akkadian with Dr. Gordon Hugenberger at the encouragement of a friend of mine. And this was uh, prior to the publication of the Zondervan text. We actually got points for every typographical error that we found. So I found a few, I think I got three points, but it was like, uh, but when I was doing that, there's no precedent within the ancient Near Eastern literature for a covenant. And what I also find incredibly surprising to me is the soul that sins shall die. And that's repeated in Ezekiel so often. And Ezekiel makes it very clear that even if Noah and Daniel and Job were around, they'd only be able to save their own selves. Whereas in Noah's flood, he has all of his sons, his son's wives, and the promise is continual and over, well, it's overwhelmingly positive. As long as the earth endures, I will never again do this. And what else I find very intriguing and stimulating, at least from my perspective, because um, I went to the Grand Canyon, actually, uh, with the uh, river raft tour. And that's actually where I met Bill Barrick and Jeremy Lyon for the first time, was on this Grand Canyon tour. But what was really intriguing to me as well is when a lot of people have a discussion about the nature of the flood, there is no um, qualifiers on the covenant. It's to all animals, to all people, for all time. And I believe that the judgment of the flood is a foil for that covenant. And I believe that this relates very heavily in terms of universalistic totalic language and then the gravity of the flood itself in proportion to the measure of God's salvation. Because there's definitely a foil going on there, I believe. Right. Yeah, that struck me... Uh... <laughs> Uh, when I was was studying chapter nine in particular, and to, to see you know this language you know with with the animals with the earth, because we often think in reading the Bible we think about covenants, we think about God making them with with individuals and, and nations and so forth. But to see this encompassing really all of His creation is, is quite amazing. It really is. Well, Dustin, I really appreciate you joining us here on Studying the Biblical Languages. This has been a great conversation today, and if you're willing, I'd like to have you back for another episode, and we can discuss uh, some of your other research, some ideas about teaching the biblical languages, and so forth. I think I'd like that. Thank you very much. You honor me. Well, you honor us with your presence here today, and we look forward to having you on another episode. 